Okay, my name is Veronica Tron. Uh, I'm a social worker by profession with about 26 years experience in the field. They are many. And you know, uh, the understanding of society uh, of sexual violence is very much influenced by the misconceptions. So it's important that we separate the myths from the facts mm. in order to stop um, or to eradicate sexual violence. I think one that's known uh, by everybody is women ask for it. Mm. Um, is it the way they dress? Is it the way they walk in a riverbed without uh, protection? Evening hours is like women ask for it. Mm. That is a big misconception because nobody in all my experience, um, I've never read about it. I haven't seen it in any uh, scientific studies that somebody asked to be raped because it's such a dehumanizing act. A, a woman's no actually means yes so it's just a way of playing hard uh, so it's not that they don't want um, the sexual act uh, but they just want to be a little difficult so that's a misconception because uh, even if it's just a no in words but even if there's also resistance in body language and stuff it should be respected as a no one a third one um that i came across is that men and boys cannot be raped and i've seen it in our be free dialogues that some of the boys started to giggle when we discuss consent and boys can also be raped so we still have the misconception that men and boys cannot be raped fact is they can be raped some other misconceptions is that rape is mostly committed by strangers fact is that it's mostly committed by somebody known to the survivor. It can be somebody in a trust position like a father, stepfather, uncle, teacher, sports coach, usually somebody that has easy access to the survivor and that can groom the survivor. Minority of cases are committed by strangers. Another misconception is that if you married, a husband cannot rape the wife. And people, the justification is that the marital vow is basically giving consent. But we know the provision in the, in the Rape Act is that um, even a married woman can say no for sex and it's against the law if the person force himself on you. The same like in, in, in couples that are in intimate relationships, it can be your boyfriend, but still you have the right to say no to sex if you don't agree with it. Um, there's another gender norm that if I buy you a dinner or if I spend money on you, it's an obvious expectation that you must say yes to sex. If I come to your room and we have a good chat, uh, I basically already say yes to sex. That is a myth, it's untruthful. They still need to be consent um, to have sex. We also sometimes believe that sexual violence is happening in dark alleys away from home. That's not the case. Our experience is that it's happening in your home where you're supposed to be safe and cared for and protected. Uh, so it happens from where you expected the least. I would want us to again separate what are the root causes and what are the contributing factors. That is important for us to understand. And the root causes are things like patriarchy. It's things like male dominance, male entitlement. Just because I'm a man, I can take what I want and what I need and there's nothing wrong with it. The male superiority and female inferiority thing. And then um, disrespect for women and children, where we treat them either as objects or we treat them as possessions. Because you married to me, 
I can do as I please, that type of thing. So those are more the underlying, the root causes. Contributing factors is, for instance, something like substance abuse, where you can, um, if you're under the influence of alcohol or drugs, you lose your inhibitions and you can end up raping somebody that you would not necessarily uh, did when you were not under the influence. But it's a contributing factor because I've also seen many cases where um, there was a long period, a prolonged period of molestation, but the perpetrator never drank or smoked. So it's a contributing factor. Other contributing factors could be uh, socioeconomic factors like there's a lot of people living in one room. I'm, I'm taking an example now of the lockdown period is where parents are going to work, but elder siblings or relatives are staying in one room with younger children. Um, chances is that, you know, the young guy can get up and there's a young girl laying, no supervision and whatever that might lead to. It can be a contributing factor. Not all sexual violence um, is violent. You can have sexual assault in a non-violent manner where the person is groomed, uh, where the person is like, um, make it to believe that what is happening now is our secret, it's our good secret, it's just me showing you how to be an adult. When we think in terms of children, um, the children can even confuse the sex with love. And that's what is so dangerous in it that the same child that was groomed in a non-violent manner can go and look for the same behavior from other adults. So it's not always that you have physical injuries and bruises and cuts to prove that is right. Um, so there's non-violent ways of sexual molestation. If I think of the community, I think of that is actually where survivors go because our research has shown that survivors uh, only comes to police and social workers a long time after the incident. Their first point of contact is somebody in the community. It can be a teacher, it can be a grandma, it can be a pastor. Um, and that's why it's of paramount importance for community members to educate themselves. Where is it that people can get help? Maybe the office hours, the contact numbers, the emergency numbers. And what is it that I can do to assist without putting myself in danger? Because we want to assist, but not to a point where you sort of put yourself in danger. So we can also have community groups where we sort of decide to put a safety plan if somebody comes to the church or to the constituency office what should be the first two three steps so you have a referral pathway to say should it be a social worker no this person rather needs medical attention should it be a state hospital or a private hospital so for them to know what to do to optimally protect the person is of importance. I've seen cases where community members meant well and they would then call in the perpetrator, basically putting the survivor at more risk. So we need to do a lot of community, community education for people to know what it is to do and what would be in the best interest of the survivor on the other side. Um, any final words um, that you have, any encouragement, call to actions in how we can better respond to this issue of sexual violence? I think by, in conclusion, I would like to say now is not the time for ignorance. It's not the time for uh, this is something that's happening out there. We cannot wait until it's under your skin and then you don't know what to do. 
So now is the time for us to act. It's, it's an urgent call for people to become active bystanders, to be part of the solution and not only to talk about the problem and how big the problem is. Thank you so much for tuning in and for listening. I hope you've learned something, something that you can uh, take with you, some takeaways, but also um, for further discussions. So please feel free to follow us on our social media platforms. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram um, for any further discussions, but also if you have specific comments to make. Thank you so much.